didn't know what to do. So I was wandering around the hall, and there was a sign on the, on the, in the corridor saying, Asian Day. I went, hmm, Asian Day, that's interesting. So I went into the auditorium and was sitting way in the back, and there was a bunch of kids in the front. And there was a guy up on the stage leaping around like a butterfly, slapping his leg and spinning and punching at the air and talking, uh, uh, you know, in Chinese. So then afterwards, after he got done with his form, he went up to the microphone and he's talking about uh, what he's doing is called Kung Fu. It's been around for a couple thousand years, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it was a deadly way of fighting and all that. Well, I'd been a boxer in the military. I'd been a street fighter. And I thought, this kid doesn't understand what fighting's about, because he was jumping around like a butterfly. So when he was done, he was, there was a little group, and they're talking. So I went up, and I'm listening to him. Now, I'm 225 pounds, uh, about five, nine and a half. Uh, tough guy. I mean, my attitude was, look out. You know, I'm tough. So I'm telling the kid, uh, hey, uh, you know, let me be honest with you. We don't fight like bugs over here. You know, we're, we, we, he went, oh, yeah? Now, there were some girls there. Everybody's kind of looking at him, and I'm going. So Bruce said, take a punch at me. And I went, what? He said, take a punch at me. And I went, well, right away, my ego's saying, oh, I'm going to show off here. And I'm very quick, especially with my jabs. So I fired it, boom! And the next thing I knew, my hands were pressed against my body. I was hitting into the stage, bouncing off this, and he was just come right into my face. And I was trying to get away from him. He was like a bad smell. You couldn't get rid of him, no matter how I moved. But he, he had me in such a way that I could not get my hands free. Well, he further embarrassed me by tapping on my forehead and asked me if anybody was home. And I really... It was, you know, there's that moment in your life when something happens and you think you either kill yourself because you've been so embarrassed or you leave the room. Well, in this case, I joined this little group that he was starting to teach because he liked my aggressiveness. He liked my physical. And he was looking for people who were street fighters, who had had a background that he could use to explore training with because he was really wanting to become exceptionally good at fighting for two reasons. One, confidence for his own ego, but also he wanted to go to Hollywood. And in order to go to Hollywood and be different than the other Chinese, he needed to be able to be exceptional in something, and martial arts happened to be what he was very good at. Other than that, he was just a busboy up at Ruby Chow's washing dishes and, and cleaning and serving. So that was going to be his future, unless he did something about it. So Bruce, when I knew him, was a punk kid, just got off the boat from, from Hong Kong, had this fascinating dream about what he was going to be. And of course, we're saying, sure, kid, yeah, 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 tell us about it. But that was my introduction to Bruce Lee, because up until that point, I had been what you would call a Neanderthal fighter, which just simply mean I, I charged, and it was really water buffalo gorilla mentality, very physical. I could take a hit, so I didn't mind being hit took me to a higher level. And I would just pound the guy into the ground. And it always worked. That didn't work with Bruce. So Bruce introduced me to two things, humility and the science of fighting. And there's where Bruce then began to use us as sort of backboards to, to investigate, to explore, to discover different fighting concepts and principles. and, and, and and this is why I'm so academic in how I approach martial arts, because I follow that same formula to, to look at karate or kung fu or muay thai, I don't care what it is, not for the quality of the art, but the quality of the elements in the art, like the pieces, the punching, the kicking, the closing, the whatever they do, and see how it relates to me as a person. And Bruce would, you know, had a, a scientific way of breaking things down. So it was a fascinating transition from from me being a punk kid and evolving up and going through a lot of personal growth and discovery, and then running into someone who, God, this 50 years later, still influencing my life. Who would ever believe it? But at the same time, it was, it was something that I wasn't aware of, but it was, it was something that I really 
again from a from a martial arts standpoint, was able to step back and reevaluate my fighting skills, my perception, uh, uh, in two ways: what martial arts was, and the other was who was I as Jim DeMille, a fighter. And I realized that I I really wasn't a fighter. I was just like a, a gorilla brought out of the out of the jungle and let loose and and uh, uh, would do whatever to survive. Whereas Bruce was like an, uh, a Baryshnikov or a Nureyev. Just the beauty of what he did so effortlessly. And I, I, you know, I can demonstrate some of the things for you. So, but anyway, that's just a simple overview of me. Well, you gotta understand what was that atmosphere. See, people think in terms of teaching and clubs. We weren't a club. We were guys hanging out. Uh, we were going to school together. We would train in the cafeteria. We would train in the library. We would train in the hallways. We would meet afterwards. We would train under what they call Blue Cross, was a parking lot, just a block down from Ruby Chow's. Uh, Bruce would have to go to work. He would have to wash dishes and do whatever he had to do at Ruby Chow's. We would meet afterwards. We would go to the movies together. We would go to Chinatown together. But Bruce was just one of the guys. Bruce was not Sifu. He was just, and when we trained, we listened to him because we really liked what he did. But as soon as training was over, he was just one of the guys. And so when we would talk and we would interact, we would interact as a bunch of guys exploring a lot of ideas about fighting. Because we did not recognize Bruce as outstanding like people would today. He was a guy who was just very uh, impressive as far as uh, his intellect and how he approached fighting and all that. So we listened because none of us did that. We were really, again, Neanderthal. We didn't, we just fought. But we didn't think about it. So when Bruce dealt with each of us, he would deal with me relative to what he thought I could contribute to him. So he would work with my boxing skills, my jabbing skills, my combination skills, my slipping and all the kind of things that were my backgrounds, plus my just pure spontaneity of attacking like a water buffalo. All of these things gave him ways to explore how to deal with this. Now over here we had Jesse Glover who was a karate background, a judo back. He would deal with Jesse relative to that. So you had to look when we, when we, we talked about teaching and training, it was relative to what we were particularly good at that would allow Bruce to focus on your interaction with that particular skill. So it wasn't that he came in with a Kung Fu system and says, today we're gonna to practice stance, you know, and punching, and no, 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 it was none of that. Today we're gonna to practice punching, but that was a, a word in which we're gonna really explore what is punching. So the boxer would talk about his view of punching, the karate guy would talk about hiya versus vertical, you know, speed versus power. It was exploratory. So when, when, when you're talking about learning and training, people immediately see a gun or a club, a dojo. No, 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 no. We were, wherever we were was our club. We'd go into a samurai movie and we'd come out and all suddenly we'd be, all be samurais and we'd be fighting like samurais and, and it was just, it was fun. But again, it was very loose, it was very spontaneous and it wasn't teacher instructor. It was just a guy who, who knew a lot of information that we were interested in because we were older than Bruce. We were not particularly interested in fighting because we realized that you get in a fight over here, you get shot. You don't drop down and say, okay, man, let's go at it. Nah, it doesn't work that way. Well, back in the 50s, it was more physical. I mean, guns were not the big thing. But the thing about Bruce was that Bruce was really into the physical because of Hollywood. He wanted to be able to develop phenomenal skills in which he could impress anybody with his, his technical skills and, and, and as well as his own competence so that he could believe in himself. So he was motivated different than us. I wasn't interested in fighting because fighting meant I would get in trouble. Trouble meant I was going to go to jail because the judge said, be clean. I had a three year deferred sentence which meant that I had to be clean for three years and then they cleaned my record. So I wasn't about to go around getting in a fight. I didn't think of that. And Jesse was, we were all older trying to just go to school and, and, and find some responsibility. 
So Bruce's potential motivated him different than it motivated us. I was just interested from a scientific standpoint. How could I, as the toughest guy in the world, be embarrassed by some 18-year-old punk kid who weighed about as much as my leg? I mean, it, it fascinated me. So I, when I listen to him and I think, how can he be so phenomenally fast? How can he shut me down as fast as I am, as good as I am, as aggressive as I am, where I can do nothing? So what I teach is relative to the concepts and principles that I learned at that period of time. And Bruce was learning at the same time. It wasn't that he knew all this. He was just a student himself trying to teach. But he had guys around him who fed back to him, challenged him, so that he evolved. But in order to evolve, we had to evolve. Otherwise, he, he, there was no need for us. So this is why, technically, we all became fairly skilled in many ways, but the, the motivation from Bruce to do that was to be better to challenge him. So there's where, again, it's so different than an instructor who has a school and he's teaching the students and they pay him. A, we didn't, I never paid Bruce a dime. I mean, there wasn't dues, there wasn't fee, why? We trained under Blue Cross, we trained in parks, we trained, you know, like I say, where, so there, and Bruce didn't see himself as an instructor. He used to say, I'm not a teacher. Well, he wasn't. He was, he was only 18, and he himself was just trying to put together a lot of the concepts and principles he had learned in Hong Kong. So you got to look at my position and my thinking and my relationship with Bruce much different than when he went to L.A. and met Daniel Nasanto and he met all that and started the JKD. Then he was Bruce Lee. He was a guy with JKD. Totally different world, totally different application when we talk about teaching and training. One of the important points about understanding how Bruce became so good is he understood the science of energy. Uh, one of the things is that for every strong line, there are always five weak ones. Now this is very important in being able to control and manipulate someone. What I mean by that is, if your opponent is big and strong, very powerful, and you oppose the energy and he's stronger, obviously he's going to push you back. So the whole idea is, is to come in contact with the energy, feel the energy, and then you, what you have is a trigger point that your brain knows that to oppose or not. But not only that is how to manipulate it. So we know that his energy coming this way is power. Where are his weak ones? If he pushes, that's a weak one. That's a weak one, that's a weak one, and that's a weak one. In other words, he could bench press 400 pounds, but that doesn't matter. It's always the same. No matter how much energy he's got going this way, he always has the four up and down. But the fifth one, the fifth weakness, is this way. As he pushes, this isn't the direction he's pushing. So this is something that you have to understand when you're learning martial arts and self-defense on how to control somebody bigger than you you need to be able to understand that it has to be a feeling of response rather than a thinking response. You need to train and understand that when you touch somebody, you can manipulate them always into a weak angle. So that if I'm touching someone here and his energy is coming into me and I feel it, I can suddenly redirect it into a trap control position because I know that he has all these weak angles. But also he has a base that once I break the base, he now is incapable of countering me. So therefore, when I am trying to teach a student, I don't get into technique. I get into the concept and principle of what makes the technique work. And in this case, we're talking about weak angles, weak energy flow, and how to control that.